Christmas is familiar to all of us. The sights, sounds, smells, the beloved traditions, they have all shaped our perspective on this most loved holiday. This is the time of year when people spend more time with family, take more time to decorate, feel more nostalgic, and act more sentimental. This is the time of year when people think more about the needs of others and actually give more to help meet those needs. But shouldn't our perspective on the celebration of Jesus' birth be shaped more by God's Word and less by the culture? Shouldn't we take the time to look at Christmas through the eyes of those who appear on the pages of the Bible, those who are actually a part of the story? I think that would change our lives forever. Good morning again to everyone here and excited to worship Jesus with you this morning. Uh, we are talking about a series over the last couple of weeks called Christmas in Perspective. And so uh, as we think about that, many different perspectives, many different people have lived and look forward to this day or that day now as we look backwards at it. And then again, from that standpoint, many have or have looked back uh, for the last couple thousand years, remembering that very day that Christ was born and the purpose behind it. And so looking at all these perspectives, I want you to think about this. Imagine that a big ball of fire came down from the sky. All right, we've used this illustration the last two weeks, so I'm going to use it again, right? Big ball of fire came down from the sky, and uh, somebody saw it as a shooting star, somebody saw it as a ball of fire, somebody saw it as a huge light, somebody else thought it was an angel coming down from the sky. You know, all these different things that people might have assumed. And then from different perspectives or different places, uh, somebody said it came over angels rest or somebody said it lit the mountain on fire. Somebody else said I saw it come right in front of Selenice and somebody else, you know, said it landed in a field. And uh, then you can go on with the smoke and the color and different things. Listen, the truth is we're talking about one event one thing that happened, and of course you have multiple ideas of how all that took place, but you also have people standing in different places. For example, don't you think that the people that saw Jesus walking on the water would have a different story to tell one from the other? Because they would have a different perspective, maybe a different heart about the whole thing and how it all took place. And so it's not different events showing inconsistencies, but different accounts of the exact same event showing further detail. And so that's what we do. We look at the Christmas and we look at the perspective of the Old Testament folks. We're looking at how they would have viewed, what they would have been focused on. A priest would have thought way different than a king. You know, a king would have thought completely different than somebody who's in the front line of the army. It would have been entirely different perspectives that these people would have had looking forward to the Messiah. And likewise, as we look at those in the New Testament, they're, they're reflecting backwards on that Christ has already came, in that case had already died and rose again. They got the whole story in play, and so they're telling a different story. Same story, as it were, but a different way of telling that. So it's been interesting. All our Hope Church locations are actually doing this series together. We all have this same graphic and, uh, and a bumper ser sermon, bumper video, all those things. Um, but we're preaching... Although the same topic, we're preaching different messages. And so within our own pastor thread, we get on there and we, hey, we're, we're going to this passage and this passage. What are you doing this Sunday? Well, I'm going to be talking about this. Oh, that's really cool. I hadn't thought about that before. It's been really neat to have this relationship. And I'll be honest with you, I have never in all of my years pastoring for almost 20 years, I've never had this kind of relationship with a group of guys. It's just neat. It's really neat. And so I'm here to tell you that I am so thrilled to be part of the Hope Church family. And uh, it's exciting with that. Now, with that being said, your Hope Church family, your Hope Church pastors of other locations have written a devotional. And that devotional, I don't have a clue because we have no way of tracking how many of you have looked at this. I wish I could say, I could tell because I'm in on all your devices and I know that you haven't seen it yet or that you are, you know, I wish I could say that, maybe convict you a little bit. No, I can't do that. But let me just tell you, this is a neat resource. All right, we've got 25 days. Uh, today is the 12th and so today would be day 12 of the devotional series. You can go online on our Facebook page and you can click the link and it'll pull you up uh, to where you can have that. You can download it on your computer, on your, uh, any one of your devices through a PDF. You can also access it through our free app and I want to keep on promoting that because that free app is really cool because it's free and because of all the resources that it has available at it and that's just called Hope on the Go. 
Android, iPhone, doesn't matter what you got, you can download the same thing, and so I encourage you uh, to do that. But go ahead, if you've missed half of it by now, they're only a page long. You can either catch up, you can catch up on your own time, you can catch up after Christmas, but start on day 12 today. Go ahead and look it up and find it. And day 13 is one of mine. So go ahead tomorrow and view one of mine. Uh, again, it's just a simple page, but uh, it does give you a different perspective every single one. So we wrote it from 25 different perspectives on Christmas. We have over the last two weeks talked about God's perspective, how we love the world. We use John 3.16 as really the format. Last week we talked about the shepherd's perspective and I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did studying it and really just looking into what those shepherds would have thought on that day. Uh, but today we're going to talk about Jesus' perspective. The one who came. We're going to talk really from him. And so uh, I'm going to take you to Matthew chapter 1. And uh, as we go to Matthew 1, uh, we'll start in verse 18. I'm going to read the story down. Last week we are in Luke 2, so it only is fitting that we read a different account, as is this is a sermon on perspectives. Uh, so here we are in chapter 1 of Matthew, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Quote from Isaiah, which we'll look at later. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. All right, well, this is going to be sort of our main text. We're going to hover around here and go out in about a couple different ways. I'll be honest with you, you thought about this sermon uh, for many weeks leading up to this, and there are so many places to go to. There are, I mean, because our Bible's full of stories about Jesus and understanding his heart and motive in this whole thing. It's amazing where we can go. And we don't have the time. And I'm attempting to actually complete a sermon in under 34 minutes. So I don't know if I'll solve that. And the people online will look me up on that and we'll see. Note, there was a four minute video at the beginning. That, nope, that's not part of the sermon. So anyway, I don't have an excuse. I got to keep it there. We're going to try as quick as we can to get that done. But listen, I want to start here in Matthew 1 and look again at verse 18. The birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. i, I got to stop there because I, I don't know about you all, but I've been reading the Bible and studying it since I was about 11 years old, 11, 12. You know, just reading it through, reading it through. I knew the stories before I was that age, and so I had heard these stories beforehand. But it wasn't until just the other day when I was reading this text that something hit me unlike it ever has hit me before. And I like to give you guys that because I figure that's kind of what God wants me to give you, right? And so here it is. And this is simple, but to me it was very profound. When his mother Mary had been betrothed. All right, so what, what's amazing about that? What's amazing about this is we've gone on for 4,000 years of existence from Adam and Eve all the way to Mary Joseph and, and all the people in between. I mean, why didn't he come in David's day? Maybe why not in Isaiah's day? How about Malachi, as then they were to wait another 400 years? Why wait those 400 years following Malachi to wait for one woman to simply be engaged to another guy? That's powerful, okay? When his mother Mary had been betrothed, not after they had been married, not before they met each other, not before the dad had arranged the wedding, okay? Not before any of that, but after they had been engaged. Do you realize that in all the talk about divorce and separation and things that happen within Scripture, that it's all around this word betrothed, around engaged, Okay, because the idea is here, and when talking about this, that when, when they made a commitment to be engaged to one another, they just used the word betrothed, when they made that commitment, that was their commitment. We use the same thing, we do it on the wedding day, and on that wedding day, they say their vows and so forth, but for them it was there. 
And so literally, as it says later in verse 19, being a just man unwilling to put her to shame, he resolved to divorce her quietly. Other translations say put her away. That does nothing to do with murder, okay? It's just simply to divorce her quietly is the idea. And so he was going to do that. He thought about that after finding out this information. You know, but I, before I go into that, I just want to think, he waited to this point in human history where just some boy and some girl, by the way, young, younger than we do nowadays in terms of marriage and stuff, young boy, young girl decide, we're going to get married. Of course, it was parents who made those decisions in Eastern culture, but anyway, you all are going to get married, so you're betrothed. And all of a sudden, Mary is pregnant. Now, how far along might she be? Ladies, we don't need to go into details here, but we're, we're easily a month, two, three, you know, something like that. In this culture, they don't quite have the pregnancy tests that we have today. And so she's probably showing maybe three months, maybe four months in. You know, how did this happen? Mary, you mu- I mean, can you imagine, just with me for a moment, just picture with me. Can you imagine being Joseph? This woman who young lady who was just, who's a, apparently a very beautiful young lady and, and, you know, matches everything their family wants and all of it's been arranged. There's going to be an, a beautiful wedding and a wedding ceremony later that take place. It's going to be an awesome time. And then come to find out you're pregnant? Listen, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that she's been unfaithful. Apparently, I mean, there's nothing else in all of history ever to this point to ever suggest that it wasn't the act of two people, right? That's what we have. That's what history seems to suggest, and that's what it's suggested ever since that very day. Nothing beforehand. And so you can imagine Joseph, his heart. You can imagine how wore down he must have been, how he thought, man, this is the, I thought this was going to be it, but you know, we'll just have to do this privately. I don't want to embarrass her name. I'll let her and her family take care of the baby. It's not mine, because he was a, as the text says, a just man. You know, so he apparently didn't do this deed. So how did all this take place? And you can imagine just being Joseph at that moment, you know. But this is just the perfect timing. You know, imagine with me Jesus before this. Okay, we've talked about his, how he's, you know, before he was incarnate, before he came in flesh, his pre-incarnate uh, appearances. We talked about uh, what they call Christophanies, appearances of Christ, uh, wrestling with Jacob and peering at the burning bush and all these different, the angel of the Lord. We, you know, we, even on, on uh, two weeks ago, we kind of discussed some of that. So I don't want to go deep into it. But can you imagine Jesus looking down at his creation? Let's assume that you all existed in 700 B.C. And in 700 years before Christ, there's, there's this guy named Isaiah going around saying all kinds of things and he's writing some stuff down and kind of a loony bin every now and again. But, you know, people follow him and he's supposed to be a man of God. So some of the stuff he's saying doesn't seem to make any sense. But can you imagine being there and think about what Christ, what Jesus would have done as he looked at some of these people? You know, as he looked at Adam and Eve, for example, all the way back. And Adam and Eve had sinned. You know, Cain and Abel. Cain had killed Abel. You go down the line that David had done these. All these things that they had done wrong. And I'm not here to point out all the failures. What I want you to see is all of these people awaited a Messiah. And all these people hoped that it would be in their day. That it would happen while they were alive so they could experience this and they could rejoice in this. And you know, instead, some people got angry with God. Why haven't you come yet? Why hasn't this prophecy come true? Why is there 400 years of silence? You know, all these things that would take place. And you can imagine Jesus just wishing that these people would hang on just a little longer. Maybe even wondering if He could go ahead and you know, say something that would point them in the right direction so they would know. And you know what? We actually have a prophecy that would encourage them. And it was written in Isaiah. Uh, so we said we'd go to it. Isaiah chapter 7, and it's verse 14. And in that text it says this, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. You're waiting for Him. You're wondering if He's going to come. If it will be in your day. Listen, you're going to have a sign. You're going to see a virgin that will conceive and bear a son. And you're going to call His name, as we have interpreted in the New Testament by the angel, which is what the word means, Emmanuel means God 
with us. It's going to happen. It's going to happen by a virgin. She's going to conceive. Now, I'm here to tell you right now that I, I just don't think Joseph got that when the first time he had the conversation with Mary and her belly was getting bigger. I don't think that that was his thought. That's right, Mary, because I know you're just perfect, and so you've never done anything wrong. You've never uh, disobeyed your parents. You've never not cleaned your room. They had rooms, okay? You've never you know, done anything like that. So therefore, uh, certainly, you must be conceived of the Holy Spirit. You're, you're the one carrying his child. Joseph didn't think that at first. He was as upset as you and I would be getting this kind of news nowadays, wondering what in the world happened and how this took place. But here um, we see as this all takes place, as it all comes about, and this prophecy that they had to hope toward, it brings us now back to our text in Matthew and uh, chapter 1, where let's take a look at verse 19. And it says, And her husband Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You'll call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. You know, as we looked back and looked at each one of these people, you know, David made decisions, okay? And, and Solomon made decisions. Ahaz made decisions. These kings, Hezekiah, they all made decisions. And they all were looking forward to a Messiah coming. Every, every one of them knew of the prophecies and were looking forward to that type of thing. But through all of history, God has never violated the will of man. Now that's an interesting concept. Something that I take from this as I read this. People made decisions of their own free will and their own volition. So whether waiting for the Messiah to come, or whether just wanting to please oneself and to sin, whatever it was, whatever decisions that they made, they made that of their own will. I think about Jesus as he was alive with, for example, uh, the Pharisees. You know, and with the Pharisees, they made their own decisions, even talking to the Messiah. Nicodemus made his decision as to whether he would be, quote, born again. The woman at the well, that she would uh, be able to go and sin no more and be able to, it, about the husbands and that issue there. Um, all these people, the rich young ruler, the disciples, Paul, everybody. And that includes you and me. And so when we're giving this message and talking about Jesus right now and talking about how he came to earth, you and I are going to make our own decisions about this. And God is not going to strong arm you to believe one way or another. He doesn't do that. He didn't force Joseph in this case to do anything. And I bring this up because, I want again, I'm thinking about as he gets this news. And he's thinking to himself that he's going to then divorce her. What would that do to the whole Christmas story if that had taken place? Are you all with me? But he's legitimately thinking this. And God did not reach down and say, no, you will not do this. You'll marry her, and this is exactly the way you're going to function. No, there was some encouragement, no doubt. An angel starts speaking to you. That's some pretty good encouragement, right? And the angel says, hey, don't be worried about this thing. You don't understand that this is how it happened. But I want you to know that Joseph still had the ability to make the decision. As they traveled to Bethlehem on a donkey, she was easily eight and a half months pregnant on that, on that donkey. Okay, going all the way, all the way to Bethlehem to be able to be counted in that census, they were not married, or if they were, people would have figured out, hey, you were married here just recently, so therefore, how in the world have you got a baby that's about ready to pop out? How does that work? What I'm telling you here is Joseph's stature was up for grabs, okay? His, his social status was potentially marred by him agreeing to do this. And yet, he chose to do it. He chose to be the dad and the husband that would help Mary as she would deliver this child and then to raise a child that's not his own. Of course, after the angel speaks, one that comes from God, which is awesome. But anyway, nobody is forced to do that. God's not going to force you into belief. He's not going to force you into unbelief. He's not going to force you to obey. He won't force you to disobey, obviously. But as we read... God is right on time. As he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, and Joseph, don't fear, verse 20, and take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived is in her is from the Holy Spirit. And goes on to talk about how he's going to save people from their sins. 
He is absolutely right on time. Now, if you've never had any problems in your life, I'm going to make a controversial statement, then you don't need God. If you don't have any problems in your life, you don't need God. Now, the truth is, everybody's got problems, and everybody needs God. (laughs) That's the truth. But I'm pointing out something, and here's the deal. When you're at rock bottom, when things aren't going the way you want them to, when people say things about you, when uh, somebody, you know, um, is just is not right to you uh, or treats you badly or any, any of these things, it's at that time that you trust in God and that you can have your relationship with Him to grow. You know, if you never had any problems in life, why would you even need God? We do because we have these problems, all right? He created you. He formed you. He knew you. He loved you. Yet you wouldn't, you know, we need to cry out to him. He's there for you at just the right times. And so in this case, here he is at just the right time to save the world. Jesus came to save. Uh, Luke 19.10, a verse that you probably have heard quoted many, many times. It says here, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. All right? He came to seek and save the lost. You and I are those. And that's the whole point of this. That's what we're looking at. So we put ourselves in these people's shoes. We look at it from their perspectives. But here, this is Jesus. You know, he's coming to save us. And this is the, probably the number one thing I want you to get from this morning. Is this, that he came for you. All right? He came with you in mind. The whole time, all the way back from before the world was created, we talked about that two weeks ago, talked about how he came with the purpose to die, all that, and we can all say it, but do you all believe it? As you get ready to celebrate, listen, how many of you are excited because somebody told you they're getting you a Christmas gift and you have a little bit of an idea what it is and you really can't wait for it? Anybody going to be honest? My hand's going up, okay? All right, I'm excited. I am 39 years old and I'm still excited about getting a gift on Christmas. It's just fun. It's a good time, right? How many of you really enjoy uh, putting lights on the house, although you maybe not put them on? How, how about you enjoy looking at the lights that are on the house? Anybody like that? You know, how about the Christmas trees? Aren't those really fun? Everybody like Christmas trees? Then listen, there's nothing wrong with all this stuff. It's a, it's a lot of fun. I love the fact that family gets together. I love the fact that we celebrate, that we're all smiling at least for a moment until you get a bratty kid that's not doesn't get what he thought he should have got I was one of those too okay um so the the idea is here we just there's lots of things to be excited about this time of year but can I just be honest with you it is altogether too easy to forget the real Christmas story now you say it you know, and, and we made a big deal in our house a couple years ago where we just we destined to, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have a, a little brownie or a cake or something, and we're going to sing happy birthday to Jesus. And then I'm going to tell my kids that he only got three gifts and y'all deserve none. I mean, um, he only got three gifts, and so that's all you guys should have, but you have like 20 between all the grandparents and everything else and all this stuff. And we should be thankful, so thankful of what God has done for us. And then again, we sing happy birthday Jesus, and we pray. And then we rip into gifts like there's nobody's business, okay? And it's just wonderful. And that is a pastor's home, okay? That's what happens. And I hope yours looks semi-similar. But listen, here's the bottom line. Even in that structure, where is Jesus really at? Where is he in the recesses of our mind? Where is he when we're celebrating the fact that he came as a baby to live an entire 33 years, not just to come and then to die, that'd been a whole lot easier, but to live so long without any sin, without any complications, any problems as far as that's concerned, uh, and then to literally be beaten to death by his own creation. Listen, when you really look at what Christmas is, God became man. Wow. Let that sink in. Because there's nothing else like it in all of history. There will never be anything else like it. Yes, we point to the resurrection. Fantastic. He rose from the dead. No one ever done anything like that, ever will do anything like that, except for that he's going to resurrect all of us in the end times. It's going to be amazing. But just the point is, his incarnation is completely unique and is to be celebrated by us Christians. Guys, I don't feel that we need to replace Christmas anyway. I don't feel that you need to change any of the things that you do and enjoy. There is nothing wrong with those things. But if you're not worshiping Jesus, 
and you're not focusing on the incarnation, the flesh of Christ, that he came down as a man, then yeah, of course, we miss the whole point. And I think we all are way too guilty of that. What, is, what was Jesus' heart? The whole thing was about us. It wasn't about him. Because can I tell you, if it was about him, Noah would never have had a go at it. Would have never got a boat. If it wasn't about Jesus, Adam and Eve would have just been expunged off the earth and we'll start with a new couple. Maybe we'll get it right the second time. I'm being sarcastic. If it wasn't all about Jesus, he surely wouldn't have come and humbled himself to the point of death, even the death on a cross. All of this was part of his divine plan. Listen, when you and I look at history, we look at it past tense, don't we? You know, you look at what happened in 1700s, and it's past tense. It's way back there, all right? We, you know, there's no way of understanding it any different. Yet, when God wrote it, <laughs> He wrote it before there was ever a present. That's the way God wrote history. And He chose you. He chose you to be here on this day. Okay, He chose you to worship Him on this year. And He chose you to be in this country, America, during a difficulty, a struggle with COVID and all these tough problems, He chose Hope Church to go through this, this idea of trying to plant a church in the middle of a pandemic. Think about that. He chose that. And that's something He wrote before there was ever a present. This is all part of His plan. And in a few short days, you're going to celebrate with your family and you're going to call this the birth of Christ. And what I encourage you to do is make it resemble the birth of Christ. Show your children, show your family, show your community what it is to really worship Jesus and all that He's done for us. Listen, Jesus chose us. He humbled Himself for us. Philippians 2, we went there a couple weeks ago, but fantastic passage of how He humbled Himself for us and died in our place, thought of us as better than Himself, all these things. And then we get down to, uh, back to Matthew 1, and we get down to verse 22 and 23. It says this, And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son. They'll call his name Emmanuel. Okay, it says the virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Now I'm here to tell you, and, and I don't mind admitting times in my life that I was wrong. I used to teach that this was bypassing the sin nature. I used to teach the bypassing the seed of man and, and all this by the fact that he would be born of a woman. But I'm here to tell you there's no biblical support for that other than me trying to take what the Bible says and make it say something it doesn't say. All right? When it comes to a virgin, can I just be honest with you? You know any other virgins who've had babies? It's called a sign. It's called fulfilled prophecy. Do I need to make it anything more than that? It's called what God said He would do, and He did it. And that's what He did. The emphasis is not on the virgin. It never has been. The emphasis is on Jesus. God with us, that He would come in flesh to be with us. That is the incarnation. John chapter 1, a great passage, and I'm just going to read a couple verses, but in the beginning, 1-1, John was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So we realize He was all the way in the beginning. He created things. It says in verse 3, All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Then I come down to verse 14, and it says, And the Word became flesh, that is, the incarnation, and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God became a man. He took on flesh. He humbled Himself to die for His creation. Again, the point is who? Jesus dying for you. Jesus thinking about you. All that He did, everything that He suffered through, all that He ever went through was for you was for me because he loves us 
You know, his, we, we can, if we focus on that, we focus on the fact that he came for us, we focus on the fact that he came to conquer death. I can go all the way back to Genesis 3.15 and I can look at that prophecy there, but all the way to the resurrection, you know, all these things from his birth to his perfect life, to him being tempted, to him overcoming sin, all these things was part of a purpose that he had to overcome death. Why? Because the results of sin was Death. That's what Romans 5.12 says. And if the results of sin is death, then Jesus came to overcome that. And in so doing, all again for us. He focused on eradicating sin and creating peace and unity. In Isaiah chapter 9, we'll look at uh, just a couple verses there. Talking about this idea of peace and unity. And it says in verse 6 and 7, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. All right, let me just break this down real quick. Really just break down verse 6. And where it says, wonderful counselor, these phrases. And I, I'm just going to give a little bit of time to this. Wonderful counselor. Most of the uses of this word wonderful in, in Hebrew, I believe there's about 80 references to this. Most all of them are in reference to God himself and to his specific power. So the idea is this is a supernatural word. You know, supernatural uh, works and wisdom far above humans that he would have. That's the idea. So this one who's coming, this one who will come, again, the prophecy of Isaiah, he will be a wonderful counselor, meaning he will have the knowledge and wisdom that other people have never had. Okay? More than Solomon, that's just even a joke that you would compare Solomon to Jesus. Okay? It's more, more, of, um, more than him. It was no, notable there that in this text, he's talking about Ahaz beforehand. Ahaz made very, very pitiful decisions that ruined a lot of people's lives. Okay? And so in that context, he says, he's going to be a wonderful counselor. All right? And kings were known to be counselors, to give judgments and rules and those kind of things. And so he's going to be way above that. A verse that we won't go to, but I'm just going to quote in Isaiah 1.26. It says that he would restore judges and counselors as at the beginning. And then here you see how he's going to do that. He's going to do that by him being the best one ever. <laughs> and he's going to come be that wonderful counselor. It says mighty God, claiming the name of God. This Messiah is going to be God. It's not going to just be some guy off the street who's going to rule and reign and God's going to give him power. No, no, no. He's called the mighty God. He himself will be the Lord himself, Yahweh himself. And therefore, in this passage, people would have known that this is talking about the Messiah. That's who they were looking for. All right, it goes on to say everlasting Father. You know, this is the, the ultimate fulfillment, what they're longing for. A father speaks of someone who cares, someone who, has, who disciplines, you know, who really loves uh, his children. And he's going to be that everlasting father. Everlasting simply shows it's going to go on and on and on. And then the Prince of Peace. This is a little more personal, right? Personal fulfillment. There's harmony. There's peace with God. And when I look at the life of Jesus, don't you see that? You see harmony. You see unity, you see peace. It takes me to one last place in John chapter 17. And in John 17, as we're reading there, a lot of people mistake this. He is still uh, in the upper room, or at least with the disciples. He's not praying this in the garden. Chapter 18, verse 1 says, and after this he went to the garden. Okay, so you can look that up. But uh, here in chapter 17, he's praying this out loud where his disciples can hear him. How else do you know that? Because it's recorded right here in the book of John. Which means John was probably sitting there writing this down as he was saying it. Likely. All right. And so here he is as he's saying all these things. I want to kind of look down. He talks about his disciples to begin with. And says a lot of really neat things. An awesome passage to look through. But verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now hold on, right there, verse 20. I don't ask for these only, which is very clear. He's talking about those you have sent me 
referring to his disciples and followers, okay? He says, not for these only, but also for those who will believe on me through their word. You're literally reading that right now. You're reading that word coming from those disciples. You're reading, you have, you have been impacted through the last 2,000 years from those disciples to this day. This passage is specifically, this prayer is Jesus praying for you today. And so he says in 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Do you see the unity? You see what Jesus is striving for? You see the whole purpose and his, his heartbeat and what he's looking at? Through his death, through his birth, through everything he lived in between, he wants you and I to be one with him and to be one with each other. Now the tough part about that is, if you look around you, there's people who've said some very weird things to you even amongst this room, right? There's people who have uh, either talked about you or said things wrong. There's people outside of this room that you know, family, friends, etc. It's hard to be one with them on this side of heaven. And yet, He calls us to that. He calls us to become one. He calls us to be one with Him so that we're one with the Father. We strive for that unity, that oneness with one another. And that gives us the peace that we're all longing to have. Because it goes on and says, I and them and you and me, verse 23, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. So this Christmas, I encourage you, you have in your hand, in your mind, you have the gospel that is so clear. It's Jesus who came so that he could die and rise again. This is what you have. He came to seek and save those who were lost. And that's you. And that's me. And so the question I have for you is what will you do with this good news? Behold, the good news, good tidings have come. What are you going to do with it this Christmas? How will you share it with the lost and dying world, with your family, with your friends? What will you do with it? And how will you impact this world with that message that we celebrate? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this day and thank you for your son. Thank you for Jesus, how he came, died, and rose again. But Lord, we celebrate his coming and we think about all that he gave up in order to be here. And we just praise your name. God, you are an awesome God. You love us and you care for us. And Father, you died for us. And so I pray if there's anybody here who's never made the decision to place their trust in Jesus, Lord, that they would make that decision, that they would trust in him and believe in him. Lord, the gospel is simple. Jesus came down in flesh. God became a man so that he could live a perfect life and die as the perfect sacrifice. And by believing in him, we have everlasting life and forgiveness of sins. Let's praise the name of Jesus as we sing in a few moments. Let's praise the name of Jesus as we give the gospel. And let's, let's just remember this Christmas what it must have been like to be Jesus. To give up absolutely everything. To die on a cross for His creation. To be murdered by His creation. But in so doing, to raise from the dead, to have power over death and sin and hell. And to give us what we now call the gospel, the good news. So Lord, use us for your glory. And we cry out to you and we love you. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.